Biobalance HealthCast episode 263, One Size Fits All Does Not Work in Medicine. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counsel. One of the fascinating things for me about working with Kathy is that I have learned so much about medicine that I never wanted to know. Yeah, didn't know I didn't, didn't know. <laughs> and and it's so amazing to, to ask her a question because she just does a data dump. She has all this stuff at her fingertips or in her brain or wherever she has it. <laughs> but we have gone just recently to uh, another international convention to try to promote our book. Uh, and one of the things that has come out of that uh, convention is a conversation between the two of us about how hard it is to change the the uh, path or the direction of medicine and what comes to mind to me as a visual because I, I think in visuals is I saw a show not long ago on how they train men and women to drive these mega tankers these super tankers mm -hmm. that take like five miles to turn or stop <laughs> so you have to start way ahead of time to mm -hmm. make adjustments in speed and course yeah. direction and that's just like so that you don't medicine. run over the wharf or don't run through the <laughs> warehouse or sink other boats mm -hmm. or what have you and they actually do it on a virtual reality machine and they teach them to start doing that so that they're not steering a real boat in real traffic what do you watch uh, <laughs> My son has been watching all these science shows, so. But it's a Leviathan. Yeah, it, exactly. The, the medical practice is a Leviathan. It's huge. Right. It's not, and I like nimble. I don't like huge because but it's huge. By, it's you can't, an institution, and it's, so it's not nimble. Right. It will never be nimble, and it slowly changes. But one of the things that we're talking about today is why have they not changed this? And that is why have they not changed the fact that People are all different sizes, weights, heights, and they have not changed dosages of medicine according to the size and of the patient. And men are not women. And men are not women, and they haven't done that. They haven't said a female dose is this and a male dose is this. Right. But even if they didn't want to do that, in some things they need to, but in others, they could just say your body size mm -hmm. or your height and weight or your BMI. But they have not. They do it for children. I'm... But they kind of ignore the fact that children who are like 12 and weigh 150 pounds and are six feet tall, I mean, kids get, you know, big fast. They ignore the fact that they should be on adult medicine, yes. and adult doses. Yes. However, we have patients all the time that need to have a standard pharmaceutical like spironolactone or an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And medicine says one size fits all. If you're five feet tall and you weigh 98 pounds you get the same dose as if you're my husband who's 6'4 250. right so if he calls his personal physician which he can't call you because of the law yeah and says i'm, I'm still uh, his personal physician i understand that. <laughs> i do understand that i mean but, i can't but the niceties of the law yes are that you can't prescribe mm -hmm. it so you have to have somebody else do that mm -hmm. and so he calls him he says i need an antibiotic then they give him a standard z-pack Right. One dose for everybody. You Which would be what I would take. And so then what happens? Because you, you told me uh, what happens. So so what happens is he takes a standard Z-Pack. He's still sick. Usually it's bronchitis. He has a kind of a bronchial kind of, yeah. yeah. He grew up in a house of smokers. And so he has a recurrent kind of bronchitis. So he, every year as, as it gets cold, he needs some antibiotics. So they give him a Z-Pack or something else that's similar same dose as i get and a week later he's still sick yeah. and and then he has to go back to the doctor so it's one visit two visits one antibiotic cost that didn't do anything and then the doctor instead of just like doubling the dose right. which may be wise because now that you've done this you've made you've given yourself a, a bacteria that are resistant because right. you didn't give enough to kill it so now they're growing and they're they're so resistant they to that antibiotic. So they have to change antibiotics. They have to give them a big time Leviquin, which is a, a very strong medication of the same family or in the same family for bronchitis. And they give him normal dose, seven days. That's still not enough. He has to have a third visit and he has to get double the dose. So Why didn't they just look at him and say, you aren't going to get the same as a... 
they measure everything by a 70 kilogram man, which is 150 pounds. Right. There's not many men who are 150 oh, pounds. He, he's been over that since he was yeah. 12 or 13. Uh, 16, but that's okay. He grew late. Yeah. <laughs> but still, that's it's one of those things that, why are we not thinking? Medicine says, we've got the smartest and the best people figuring out figuring out your health care. Why have they not figured this part out? I realize it's a Leviathan, but mm-hmm. they've had, you know, 100 years to do this. But there's a resistance to it, in part because it doesn't seem like an emergency. I mean, things respond things change in response to emergencies or the perception of an emergency. And one of the warnings that I've heard my entire adult life about antibiotics is eventually they're not going to work for us because we've all taken too many of them for too many reasons. So something new is going to have to come along. And when that something new comes along, they find it, then there will be an adaptation or change. Well, that's because bacteria uh, are, you know, very small, very fast multipliers. So, they can change their genetics right. to adjust to an antibiotic. That's why amoxicillin and ampicillin don't work very well anymore. Mm-hmm. Because most of the bacteria that we have that cause us illness are resistant to it. But that doesn't give you a good reason to give an antibiotic that will give you more resistant bacteria at a low dose because it didn't kill the bacteria. Well, and sometimes That's a they... bad practice. I mean, it's giving us more and more resistant bacteria that way. If you just get an antibiotic that actually kills the bacteria, you're not developing resistance. You're killing the bacteria. So it, it's more complex and multifaceted than that. You're oh, yeah. absolutely right. But then you have the systemic responses that come into play. And we've had conversations about the FDA and whether or not a medicine is authorized by the FDA for particular <clears throat> usage. Mm-hmm. And whether doctors can legally or appropriately use that medicine for an off-label reason, as if the FDA is the sole arbiter of how and why you would use a particular medicine. And it's not. But a lot of the but it does control what we can get. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Well, a lot of the serendipitous discoveries come when somebody uses a, a non-standard intervention. Mm-hmm. You know, you you learn one size fits all. This is what you do, and as long as it works for most people, most people are fine. But you get those exceptions for which it's not fine. Then you have to be creative. You have Mm -hmm. to think. uh, You You have have to to adapt. And you have to experiment. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it legally. Mm -hmm. You have to do it within the protocols and codes of your profession. But if you follow FDA guidelines, then they would say everybody starts on uh, 250 milligrams of zithromycin, which is the z pack. Everybody. So that's their guideline. The yeah. FDA is in, in control of that. Right. So for a certain disease, you get a certain dose, and it doesn't have anything to do with how big you are or how right. little you are. So that's how they just give an average. They're going for the average, the middle guy, mm-hmm. the middle guy and not women. So, you yeah. know, there's a lot of women under 100 pounds. Mm-hmm. If they take a normal dose, uh, I have one example who took a normal dose of Ultram for pain, and it knocked her out. She was on the floor. She couldn't get up. She was nauseated. She was so sick. She weighed 98 pounds. Yeah. And that was too much for they, her. But initially they thought something else was going on. Like she Right. And then she ends up in the ER. But had a stroke or something. It was because she had too much of a drug cuz she's a little tiny person. Yeah. So well, this is this causes problems. It causes complications. They're never reported. One of the places where they're beginning to adapt it is in the treatment of the elderly. Right. Because there's a, a big discussion in medicine about how the elderly are often over-medicated for this exact reason. Mm-hmm. They give them the dosage they would have given your husband at, mm-hmm. at 250 and 6'4". And, and when, 65 years old. And he, yeah. And he's so then when old. he's 90 and shriveled up, mm-hmm. you know, they still give him the same dose. That's true. That's true. And, and that's a problem. And, it's, and they are recognizing that. So really what you should look at when you're, and I do when I'm treating patients, I, I basically learned this fact, not mm-hmm. from how I was trained, but because I do hormone replacement. And for hormone replacement, I have to look at the size of the patient. Mm-hmm. I have to look at how much activity they have because I'm using a long-term dose. Like all my hormones last four to six months in general, four for women, six dosed for men. So in for most men. So I have to look at how how fast their liver works like if you're on five drugs your liver's going to use up your 
uh, hormone fast or any other drug that uses that same uh, system to break it down, you're going to use it up faster. If you're a marathon runner, you're going to use it up faster. If uh, you stay up all night or have shift work or don't sleep much, you're going to use uh, up your hormones faster. So many of these things have to be taken into account when you decide on what to give to a person on their initial dose. Mm -hmm. After that, you can adjust it as to how they they you know react to it but initial dose is i kind of have to talk to them get all kinds of information and then look at them and look at their med list and even family history to decide what to treat them with once i started doing that i started seeing or being aware of all of those people who were not responding to the normal dose mm -hmm. and that takes more than hi. I have a, goes I off, have yeah. bronchitis. I need an antibiotic. Okay. Yeah. That takes more than that. Right. Because we're using too many drugs, too many antibiotics, mm -hmm. and we're making resistant bugs. But we're also not treating people right. Why should you be off work? Why should John be off work three days because instead he of has one? Bronchitis. It's, instead of one, exactly. when he could have gone to the doctor and gotten the right dose and. And that would have been it. Well, but then he also pays for three doctor visits and two or three different prescriptions. Right. So somebody somewhere is making money. Right. But insurance companies aren't happy about that because they're having to pay for it. Yes, it's discounted to them, but they're still having to pay for it. So not that I think that they should be the enforcer, but they should be at least looking at this, mm -hmm. and seeing how many types of antibiotics somebody needs for one infection. Mm -hmm. And and we should all learn from that. If if. ZPAC didn't work for that patient. Well, last time, then let's just drugs. give them the, the last, the other dose. Yeah, they, they do that for some drugs, like mm -hmm. uh, antidepressants. Mm -hmm. They often will put out protocols and training programs mm -hmm. for doctors on, if you're going to prescribe uh, antidepressants to an adolescent mm -hmm. uh, or male or female, as, mm -hmm. uh, what's the right dosage and how do you regulate it. So they do that for Psychiatry some. Psychiatry has come a long way. Okay. Yeah, uh, they, they, because they're talking to patients. They know if things, I mean, they're talking for well, a long time. They're talking for an hour, half an hour. They're getting all this feedback instead of having five or ten minutes in the doctor's office. Yeah, you told me once that the average doctor in a, in a clinical practice is seeing a patient every seven minutes. That's right. Because of the cost of operating their office and, and the reimbursement what issues from insurance. Yeah. They've got to find that sweet spot where they can pay their bills and make their money, but still see patients. Mm -hmm. And so, and so well, you got seven minutes to get in and get out, and you mm -hmm. have to go through all the computer checklists and what have you. And and a lot of people are not even able to do that. Mm -hmm. So an awful lot of people in our society go to emergency rooms or urgent care places when they're in crisis, when their systems are completely distraught or debilitated. <clears throat> they have an acute issue or they have a long-term devastating issue and they show up for emergency care and they don't show up for the regular doctor business. no and they don't and and they either don't have a regular doctor or they don't have a relationship with one and so you, it's a sort of a two-pronged issue how do we convince people or change the face of medicine mm -hmm. so that people can have personal doctors that do know their history their size, their dimension. I mean, like and who insur insurance pays them yes. to sit down and talk to somebody. Yes. When I was in medical school, they said you get ninety percent of your information from the history, mm -hmm. and ten percent from lab or other tests that you do. Right. Now I would say everybody's working off of just tests and not taking the history because that takes longer. Mm -hmm. They can just look at a test and make a decision. And I'm not talking about every doctor, but the, I'm talking about the, the doctors who are treating my patients, and then my patients come in and say, well, I brought that problem to my doctor, and he or she just said, well, we'll d deal with that next time, or something like that, because they didn't have time. I mean, I'm, I have compassion for the doctors who are working with insurance. I don't. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I don't, because I can't do medicine with insurance the way I think it should be done. Mm -hmm. and the way it's best for patients and best for me. And a lot of what doctors are asked to deal with is not a seven-minute problem. Huh. I mean, many things are. Many things are, okay, you have bronchitis. This is how we treat it. Here, go take this. But some of it is you have to figure out what's going on. Why did it happen? How do we intervene? What's the hierarchy of interventions that we mm -hmm. use? Whether we're going to need surgery, whether we're going to need x-rays. And you still only have seven minutes. That, that It just doesn't work. Everybody runs behind then. Yeah. Because... 
we base it on a simple problem. We base our time frame on a simple problem, but and they all know that you can't see a patient in seven minutes, or they double book, you know, maybe 14 minutes and double book, but it's still. Okay, so I've always wondered, <laughs> your average doctor, whatever that looks like, whoever that might be, and I realize there's no such thing, mm -hmm. but generally, would you say 70%, 80% of their contacts are for standardized things that don't take a lot of time or energy. Like blood pressure. Right. Or whatever. Or, I, or I have a cough or, you know, can you, my well, kid a is cough a isn't fever. a simple cough. A cough is, do you have an, <laughs> do you have a virus which takes questions? I, no, do you I, have exactly a bacteria? Do you have lung cancer? Yeah. Do you have emphysema? I mean, you have to be examined for that. Yeah. You may need an x-ray. We may not get to the answer. You know, but I always tell my patients, you shouldn't leave your doctor's office without a plan. You should always say, so what's the plan? Right. Because many doctors will go, well, we'll take a look at that. You don't know when you're supposed to come back. I mean, <coughs> they're thinking about other stuff, like how far behind they are. And uh -huh. they have to call the ER and somebody else has a call waiting for them. They, they're they thinking about other things. But still, you need to know what your plan is. You're the patient. Mm -hmm. So if they don't tell you or you didn't hear it, then you have to ask that before they leave the room. Well, and it's really hard. People do a lot of magical thinking. And one <laughs> of the ways that you know somebody's doing a lot of magical thinking, if you're at their house, check their medicine cabinet. Because people like me. You, you <laughs> don't look me, in my medicine cabinet. No, no. Don't, got, ever, got, don't ever look in my medicine I've got a hundred supplements in my medicine cabinet. <laughs> that was a sardonic aside, not a, not a recommendation. Uh, but a lot of people put medicines in their medicine cabinet that they've not completed taking. Right. Like if you give me a prescription, 10-day prescription for antibiotics, and I feel better in three days, I quit taking them. Then I save them so I can self-diagnose and self-prescribe. Mm -hmm. or just Share them with the, somebody. The universe will know I've got the defense, yeah. and so it won't give me that infection again is the way I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we have out-of-date ear and eye medicine for our dog. Yeah, but, you know, out-of-date is another cabinet. problem. Out-of-date <laughs> isn't always out-of-date. Uh, I understand that. That that's that's Those are kind, recommended. That's time a time. recommendation from the drug companies to make more drugs. Yes, indeed. So it isn't necessarily out of date when it throw says it, away it is. Like two days after it's out of date. Not even a years? year. Yeah. Yeah. Four years for a dog. Yeah, probably it's okay. Yeah. But <laughs> a dog is not. But one of my not have one the of same my points is as my dog's medicine is in my medicine. Oh well, that's a problem. Of somewhere else. So <laughs> middle of the night when I can't see and I go and get it, and I need an ear drop or an eye drop. You know, he, my son may start barking. Yeah, well, don't so, do that. That's not that. Yeah, you but should people keep it. collect it, and, and and then they think it's treating them by it sitting in the bottle. Yeah, exactly. It's well, it's a shield. It protects them from danger, and so they mm -hmm. keep it. And they have, and so like when an old person dies, and you go to their house, and they have seven thousand bottles of sixty-two hundred different medicines, and they're all full. They're all full, <laughs> and most people throw them in the trash, mm -hmm. or grind them up and throw them down the. The garbage that goes disposal. Back into our so then they get into the water table and mm -hmm. get back in the food and water, and we're all mm -hmm. and the cows are getting all these. Hormones. So the way you get rid of those is you get a little. You, there are little boxes that have charcoal in them, and you can put them in those boxes with the charcoal, and that will that will break it down so and, and filter it basically so that it doesn't get back into our system. So well, you a lot can of do that. Well, are now offering you know, drug turn-in days. In local communities where you bring in any, any amount of anything and turn it in and they don't ask any questions that's true so that they can dispose they of do. it safely and not get it into the environment but it is a truly complex problem and where we were starting our so we got problems on the side of prescribing oh God, yeah the fda the doctors yeah and making decisions without talking and then patients who aren't listening and aren't completing their treatment which gives you resistant bacteria i mean you have to complete antibiotics to actually kill the bacteria so you don't get resistant. If you do three days, you're better and you stop, well, then, you, you then know, that's not a good thing. You're making yourself immune do, do you know to the those antibiotics. you that, that uh, handles most non-compliant patients? No. Undertakers. Yeah, well, and that's something you have to think about. Yeah, because that is, it's not just one size doesn't fit all. <laughs> yeah, where, where did you get your medical degree? Right, but yeah. but you have to actually take the advice of physicians. We were trained to do all this. And yeah. if you need more time or need more um, help, then you need to ask the front desk to book you two appointments mm -hmm. or more time than you were given this time. Because that 
is what's going to be required for you to get what you need. One size doesn't, one time frame doesn't fit all, one size drug doesn't fit all, and, and seven minutes isn't going to cut it for most of us. I mean, you can get your blood pressure checked and your medicine refilled, but that's well, about it in seven minutes. We've done podcasts about how to prepare for doctor's visit. When mm -hmm. it's not an emergent care issue mm -hmm. and you know you have a doctor's appointment next month, there are things that you need to do to prepare to bring yourself in there to get maximum return for value. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in terms of health, in terms of money. Uh, and speak up because if you had, like, <laughs> my husband thinks that people, the doctors, like, get what he's thinking or remember that. He, he thinks you get what he's I thinking. Know, I know. I realize yeah. that. But, okay. You know, I, sometimes I do. But, yeah. but he thinks that his doctor can read his mind and know that last time he took three antibiotics to get rid of that bronchitis. Right. Well, we can't read your mind and oftentimes we can't we don't have that information it may not even be in your chart so you have to remind us you know i took three antibiotics last time nothing worked until i got this why don't we just start with this right you know this particular antibiotic because i don't have more sick days at work or i you know i don't want to be sick and i would stipulate to you that women will know that and know what i know they've that taken and I know. Men won't Right, but I went if, to the doctor. He gave me something. What did he give you? I, I don't know, but it took three well, tries. And then my wife was sitting there. She said, <laughs> well, he gave you this, and then he gave you this, and he gave you this. If he wrote the script, mm -hmm. he can look on his computer, yes, and it'll if, be if right you have there. The he'll, that knows you. he'll see the three things that you got, yeah. and then he'll look at the bottom one. And if he's wanting, you know, if he's agreeable, and will take your history as fact, an indicator. That's right, and an indicator then. He or she will then give you the proper antibiotic for you at the proper dose. But to come back to the Leviathan, what a lot, a lot of doctors do in order to survive <laughs> is they standardize responses that they learned in medical school. I know. And for years and years and years, they just, you know, if A, then B, if B, then C. Amoxicillin 253 times a day. Exactly. That's it. And, and amoxicillin rarely works for anything anymore. So okay. when you want to steer the Leviathan, you have to get somebody's attention and say there's a roadblock ahead. We need to make a turn. Mm -hmm. We need to make a speed adjustment or a course adjustment. You have been trying to do that. <laughs> the the anti-aging medicine doctors groups that you belong mm -hmm. to and have been attending conferences for are trying to do that. There is a presence and a momentum to say we need to reconfigure how we think about some of these things. We need individualized medicine, yes. which is what we're talking about, where your doctor individualizes it for you and everything about you. Mm -hmm. And we need, just like we need individualized education and individualized psychological help when we, when you, you, don't, you don't necessarily go to a lecture when you're having problems with your spouse. You go to one person to help you talk about what's exactly wrong with that relationship, not every relationship. So, so what we're talking here about here is individualized medicine versus just standardized medicine, mm -hmm. and that's the one size fits all. So if you're in those groups, you don't weigh 150 pounds and you're not male, mm -hmm. then you probably are going to have to have some adjustment in, in your dose of medication other than what the FDA tells us to give everyone. Absolutely. And, and one element of that is for doctors to continue their training and stay current. Mm -hmm. And they do have to take... Uh, continuing education hours. And, I can and promise you it doesn't have anything to do with this stuff. But you were talking about, <laughs> for, for an example of discussing this, mm -hmm. uh, saliva tests that tell whether or mm -hmm. not you can take blood thinners or whether right. or not, which ones might work for you. We have genetic testing that you can get, but it's not covered by insurance, which is always an issue. Right. But you can get saliva testing to see if you have the genes that are going to be able to respond to one blood thinner but not the other. Or if if a beta blocker, which everybody uses for blood pressure and fast heart rate, whether that even works for you or if you need a higher dose than other people, you can actually genetically find that out. Someday we'll have individualized genetics on the chart and we'll know what we can give you and what we can't. Mm -hmm. So that's the future. That's not now. And and since we're dealing with the Leviathan, I don't think it's coming soon. But people who practice integrative medicine or preventive medicine are people who are looking at you individually. And that may be the direction that you need to go to find someone who will, if you've been having trouble, who will treat you as an individual. Mm -hmm. So good luck. <laughs> Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. 
For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.